Okay, so um, hello again, everyone. I'm Mishari Mukbil. I'm based out of uh, Bangkok, Thailand. I have a consultancy company, uh, Simple, and I also do some work alongside Bitergia as a senior consultant in uh, Asia Pacific. And today we are going to talk about cultural crosswires since inner source is often a an initiative that spans continents and various cultures and even if you are acting in the best of faith you possibly can you are bound to mess something up and i have messed up a lot this is this talk contains some of the incidents that have scarred me and i am putting it across to you uh, in order to so that you can learn from my mistakes as well as to see if you have any comments to come and help make things better for us all in the future so warning this is not an anthropological study so please take it with a grain of salt um it's based on my personal experience and the sample sizes are naturally small. I take absolutely no responsibility for the way that you used uh, the content uh, of my talk. So why me? I am, you can put it a, a somewhat global citizen. I am a minority of a minority in the country that is, uh, um, that is a minority. My wife is also a, a minority. I have been to a, uh, to a, a, a Christian school. I'm a Muslim uh, in a Buddhist uh, country. I speak uh, several, I speak languages from several language families. So most people will say, say speak English with a bunch of, uh, say, Latin based languages, but I speak English, I speak Thai, uh, Urdu, uh, Japanese, Bahasa, Indonesia, and these are from three, at least three different language families. I have been impacted by the early internet, uh, so I culturally I have a geeky, techno-utopian, libertarian uh, slant to my worldview, and I mostly identify myself along uh, uh, those lines. And I have worked with uh, people in almost every part of the world, except for Central Africa. And on top of that, I am an introvert by default. I do not, admittedly, I do not feel comfortable around humans. Um, so I basically have a very detached perspective on humanity. Now, when we go through this, if you relate, I would like to see a thumbs up from you. If you don't relate, have an open mouth. This is just so I know whether other people are sharing this experience or not, or if it's just me. That will be super helpful. Thank you, Sebastian. So as I started on this, right, I came up with the uh, uh, with the topic alongside um, Olive on that day, and. I decided, okay, well, just to make sure that I'm getting this right, let, let, let me see what the definition of culture is. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, it's the customs and beliefs, art, way of life, and social organization of a particular country or group. But, okay, interesting enough. So then I looked into the etymology, right? And apparently it comes very interestingly, it comes from tilling the land, right? Um, which is why you also use the expression uh, when you culture bacteria. And I thought that that is a very interesting root for this word. And I almost got this wrong because in Thai, there is uh, the word culture itself has a different background right though it's the word watanatam it means uh it comes from watanat means to develop or evolution and tam means condition or state 
So it implies an ongoing process and a dynamic nature. It is, and it doesn't have any agrarian roots. We, so we can't use Watanatam in the context of gardening, whereas we can use the word culture uh, for that. The closest equivalent in English would be the word, the, the word where something is cultured. So that would be the Thai equivalent um, of Watanatam. Now, so the reason that I wanted to bring this up is that even that with something so straightforward as the topic of this talk and the word culture, there are subtle differences in these approaches and these subtle differences multiply over the interaction that we have with one another. And it, and it defines our mental models when we interact with each other, which is why a lot, which is where a lot of misunderstanding uh, happens, right? So there are plenty of books about this, but what I've found is that many of these books talk about differences between cultures separated by geographical boundaries, each with its uh, rich history. But I don't think this can actually cover everything that can go wrong with, communi with communicating cross cultures, especially in an interconnected, increasingly interconnected world where we can belong to different cultures or even create our own within our own groups, right? I mean, let's face it, right? <laughs> Even for our people who share some sort of a similar background, that spend an extraordinary amount of time together, there are countless amount number of books about how to communicate with your spouse. And the fact that new ones keep coming up really shows that it's not a solved problem. I mean, forget about different cultures. One of the famous books frames uh, couples and coming from entirely different planets. Right. So I, I know that we are, that we live in an era where everyone is trying to assert their views on, on the world. But I think that the, the number one thing I try to do is to have some empathy and assume good faith until, unless and until the other party shows otherwise. There are certain parties or personality types who prey on compassion and be wary of them, but they are a minority. I think most people just try their best to interact with their fellow human beings and just get it absolutely wrong. So my fir the first topic uh, that really gets people often is uh, the issue of time. So I went to a wedding in India, right? Fancy wedding, like at the country club. Card says arrive at seven o'clock. By seven o'clock on the dot, I was there and they were still setting up the stage. The guests arrived at nine o'clock. Erin Mayers in the book Culture Map talks about this as linear time versus flexible time. Uh, we may think of time as being an absolute measurement, but precise timekeeping, if you think about it, it's a relatively new invention for humanity. And many cultures still treat it as a suggestion. Uh, the same way you would if you if someone says, I have a thousand things to do, right? It would be very, very weird to take that literally. And it's the same with time in some culture. You give people an exact time, and if you take it literally, people are like, What what is happening? Well, why are you why would you do that? Right? It's it's a metaphor. So the, the way I solve this problem is to try to understand how people perceive time and to try to work around it. I will not try to get a firm commitment from someone who doesn't have a linear model of time in their heads. And I do free, uh, frequent follow ups instead based on tasks and things and, and things to do. Uh, just to keep a light pressure, but it would, but it's 
counterproductive to actually talk to uh, certain groups of people uh, when they don't have a, a very precise notion of time. So the next thing that, come, that comes up is self-centered uh, versus other centered. And for me, sometimes it's like playing Minesweeper. Um, you, you don't really know when you are going to uh, push the wrong button. So we had implemented a long, um, sorry, we had implemented a product and I had issues with some of the product experience. So I spoke to team members who own that feature and told him that this isn't as good as it could be and we should work on making it better. I promise I was, I was no more, less polite or more aggressive about this. This was the crux of what I had spoken about. I was kind of expecting an Oh, okay, Mishari, what concerns do you have? Uh, let's see if it's justified and how does one make it better? Instead, I was met with, why should I do anything about it? You should have said something earlier. The product's, uh, the product's already finished. After I all put in all this effort, now uh, you tell me now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not the first time that I ran into this. Uh, um, the, uh, these people exist. They are very, very difficult to 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 to, uh, to work with, and I see it as, um, as 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 a pattern. I cannot define the culture, but I can tell when uh, um, I can reasonably predict these days when I'm going to face these kind of uh, uh, people. Have you guys ever faced any of this? Uh, please give me a thumbs up. If you have, I don't see any. Or um, open mouth if you um, if you have not. Funnily enough, I can't actually see anyone. Okay. Sorry again. Thumbs up or a uh, thanks. Thanks, Katie. Good to see. I'm not the only one. So I'm not entirely sure. I'm referring to this as. Self-centered is correct. However, um, however, some people are very inwards looking. Things are about them, while other people tend to look outwards at the issue at, um, at hand. So most self-help books about cultures say something about empathy, but I this may sound a bit harsh, but if you enter the situation, really the only thing that you can do is let them vent or have a neutral third party in the room to uh, help help mediate. Uh, one thing that works is to say something like, thank you, I will take what you say under consideration or something like that and, 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 and come back and continue the conversation uh, later after the, uh, the temperature goes down. Um, the books say you should empathize. Yes, empathize, but perhaps later. Uh, that's my suggestion. Proactive versus passive. Uh, this has been difficult for me to describe as a concept, but basically if things need to be done in some cultures, you get up and you just uh, do it or, or you organize yourselves and your friends to get it, to get it done. However, in other cultures, it's really not so simple. People think that someone else should be taking the initiative. Someone else should be taking the leadership position. It is someone's responsibility, but that responsibility is not, not me. I run Coder Dojo Thailand. It's a programming club for kids age 17, 7 to 17, logos up there. And, and I can tell which kids are schooled and which are homeschooled. Uh, the ones who come and sit at the desk and wait are most certainly the ones who go to school. And the ones who start bring out the computers and start working on things are probably the kids uh, who are homeschooling. And this is a culture that has developed. And I see it across whether we are working on inner source that, hey, you should come and fix a bug. And they say, what, me? Why, why me? This doesn't feel right. 
um, you know, and, and uh, another illustration of this is when I give uh, give a talk. So when I, for example, gave an inner source talk in Singapore, right? The Q and A session lasted five minutes. I had one question. However, when I gave the same talk in Japan, the Q and A session lasted hours. So this is what I mean by by uh, by pro proactivity. My uh, our Japanese friends. They were very proactive. There's a situation here, and they're here to learn. And they took ownership of that, right? They made the most out of the situation and learned the most that they can. They didn't wait, or they didn't put the entire burden for their learning on, on me. And I find this to be a, a cultural thing, uh, being proactive or being passive. It also somewhat has something to do with hierarchy as well, but I'm not entirely sure how. So one way that I try to solve this problem is through growth mindset. Um, there are probably other ways, but then it's a way of communicating the fact that personal growth is, is desirable. I don't really have a way, a good way to do this as, uh, except to encourage people to take risks and responsibility, reward them for it, give them encouragement, and and prompt them to make the most out of their uh, their experience, as well as to do as to contribute when the opportunity arises. This is, I find, also something that is deeply ingrained, very similar to uh, to time, and it takes a lot to bring people out of it. Uh, another solution that works is to turn things into play. Humans, no matter what, love a good game. So you can somehow convert things into a game um, that also creates proactivity. This is also very interesting um, because what will what, what will happen in many communities is that you, you as a as a community leader you want to know what people are good at what people are interested at so that you can approach them and give them a task that is that they're interested in or they're or they're good at right and also this applies when you are giving uh, a talk as well so in some cultures, uh, you, I find that it's perfectly okay and expected for you to speak loudly and clearly about your positive attributes, right? While in other cultures, that is considered a bad form. It's considered bragging and it is discouraged. However, um, what people tend, the work on that people tend to do in that regards is to do a humble brag. It's when you talk about your achievements uh, while at the same time playing it down. Um, in Thai, actually, this is a problem because uh, there's an expression which translates roughly as the, the, the tallest grass gets mowed down which makes it very, very difficult to have people do exceptional things or even take the, uh, take the, uh, the initiative. So the way I sort of resolve this problem when I am, um, before I give a talk or, is I would see how the local speakers do it. Right. If, uh, you can open on YouTube and when and especially if they're speaking in their local language, uh, you can um, you have automated subtitles in YouTube now. So you can use uh, you can use that. You don't really need to see the details, but just see how they introduce themselves. Right. And you can copy that style. OK, so. Um, and when you have a community, right? you you work on things together sure enough you go out for a meal this is something that i get horribly wrong uh often as well eating is one of the oldest activities that humans performs together socially 
Right? You can imagine the, our cavemen sitting around the fire, sharing a meal and a conversation, right? Uh, some people say it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's little wonder that various cultures have built up different rules surrounding this activity, but I found none as quite as controversial or risky as the question of who pays for this meal. I was once a guest at the gentleman's house in, in, in India, and I thought it would be a nice gesture if I picked up uh, the bill for, for a meal that he had, uh, uh, had taken me, uh, me to. Yeah. So I secretly did so. I went off and I, and I, and I, and I paid. So um, when he found out about it, instead of being happy, he was furious, right? He was, he was insulted because apparently I had, um, I had sort of robbed him of the opportunity of being a gracious host, right? Um, and it's a bit of a problem. Uh, in Japan, when I was there, um, and when I was in Singapore as well, uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the other party paid. Um, sometimes we both paid for our shares. Uh, sometimes I paid. Uh, in Thailand, it is mixed, often tied to a hierarchy. So if you're sort of the older or the higher status, you would tend to be the person paying, um, not paying for the meat, right? And then also, funnily enough, in Thai, we have the expression uh, American share, which means that everyone pays for themselves. So um, uh, do you guys have this problem? Thumbs up, open mouth. Uh, thumbs up if you do. Thank you, open mouth if you don't. So the way that I, I solve this problem these days is negotiate the terms upfront. Um, you know, um, I have a lighthearted conversation about who pays, agree on it in advance be, uh, before the meal. And uh, I, I, I like taking turns best, right? There is some overhead, but it's nice because it uh, appeals to the human spirit of reciprocity. It also is a good opportunity to uh, to catch up again later, to balance out the scales of karma. Mm. Uh, running out of time, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, this is also something that is very difficult. Um, I find that certain parts of people, especially North Americans, speak without a pause. And I never really understood how to have a conversation with these people until I had two of them in my car at one point. And they did not allow each other to stop talking. It was really weird. They were not, they did not complete a single sentence. They were just talking over each other. Um, until today, talking to Americans confuses, uh, North, many North Americans confuses me. Um, I have no idea when I'm supposed to jump into a conversation. Uh, on the other hand, in, uh, in Asia, we try to give each other um, clear space to talk. And it is, we actually have to explicitly encourage each and every person to talk and give, sort of give them permission to do so. Tell them it's okay, it's your turn to speak now and you are most welcome to speak uh, clearly and directly. Um, solution? No solution, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, so next one, uh, concise versus uh, elaborate. Pascal in his letter wrote, I have made this longer than usual because I have not time to make it shorter. And I, and I love that, right? And I thought that, okay, for me to be a, a good human being, I must always write things concisely. And that is, and it, is, it was the epitome of politeness and virtue until I met Bob. I've always had difficulty um, communicating with Bob. He's quite aggressive in his emails and keeps calling on the phone. Uh, anytime he thinks it's, he's appropriate, it's a scheduling, a scheduling a call like uh, everyone else. And he gets very, very angry when I don't uh, receive his calls. Anyways, 
I got uh, tired and one day I decided to use ChatGPT to rewrite my emails and telling it, um, giving it the persona of Bob and say, write my emails as a 60 year old, year old American male. Um, the email was very long and very elaborate. Not my style at all, but I decided to send it anyway. The re results were miraculous. Um, apparently the vernacular resonated with Bob and in return, I got an uncharacteristically mellow answer. I'm not sure why it worked. I asked my mother who's the same age and she says that the people of a certain generation like long communication because it makes them makes it look like the other party took the time and effort to write the correspondent. Yeah, fair enough. Solution, privacy concerns aside, ChatGPT does an excellent job at mirroring communication style. So if in doubt, give it the persona of the person you are talking to, perhaps even give them a sample of the text of the person you're communicating with, let it rewrite their text. Of course, privacy considerations as well. Thumbs up, open mouth. Anyone else have ever faced this? Thank you, Alan. All right. Uh, I think that uh, this comes to Lazan. How do you call other people? Right? In English, it's Mr., Miss, Mrs., gender based plus marital status, roughly, plus uh, last name. So often the first. Uh, name is acceptable in Thai is re often related to a hierarchy of the person you're talking to, which you have to figure out. Also, incidentally, in Thai, we have colorful nicknames that you actually talk to people. So people will come up to you and say that, hi, my name is Porsche or Big Mac or Internet. And that is their, uh, their name. In Japan, um, it's correctly the last name plus San. Uh, but once you uh, become a less informal, it can be first name plus son. In Arabic, uh, there's the kunya, um, where you refer to someone um, as the father or mother of the older child. So, for example, if I'm, let's say, uh, Sebastian's dad, I would, uh, people would call me uh, Abu Sebastian. Yeah, take that thing. Um, for many Chinese, that's a Western name as well as a Chinese name. And online people are okay to be being referred to by their handle. It's really, really uh, very confusing. I get this wrong um, all, all the time. The solution to that, uh, if it's online people, I tend to use their online handle. Everything else, I just use ChatGPT. I tell them, I tell that ChatGPT that I know this person from this country. How should I refer to them? And ChatGPT tends to, for the most part, does a pretty good job of, uh, of telling me how I should uh, refer to them. Uh, just a reasonably good guideline. So um, we are out of time. There's um, uh, some closing remarks. So no one can understand fully comprehend another culture in its entirety. Uh, remember that our interpretations are often based on our own cultural lenses. Right? Continuous learning um, is important. Um, it's an ongoing journey. You should keep curious and keep learning. Be and uh, read fiction by diverse uh, authors if you really want to understand. Uh, Read, uh, for example, if you want to re understand J Japan culture, culture, Japanese culture better, read a book by on, uh, read a book set in Japan by a Japanese author. Right? Don't read the equivalent by a by, by a Western author by the West by a Western author. Uh, keep an open mind, um, respect and appreciate. Uh, there are things that there's a good chance that you you would find offensive. Um, or vice versa, but try to maintain respect and, and, and appreciation. It's um, these values are not necessarily uh, universal. And so um, final thoughts as we navigate our culturally diverse world, let's commit to learning, understanding and respecting each other's cultural in idiosyncrasies because this is what makes 
humanity wonderful. So with that, I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much. So any questions?